Good morning. Let's stand for our call to worship. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is our, the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his, he will hear us. Let's sing. Good morning and welcome. If you're visiting or you come every Sunday, please fill out one of those attendance cards in the pew in front of you. And if you have any prayer requests, anything you want to note on there, please do so. Also, in your bulletin, there is an insert, and this is for our 110th anniversary celebration. We're only three weeks away, and we're excited about all that's going to be happening. We're looking forward to having Dr. Melvin Newen and one of our former ministers, Greg Key, here with us for that, that weekend. If you are planning to eat lunch and you would like a tamale lunch, please make sure you put down how many you want. They are free, 
for those that have registered, we need, we need to know how many we're going to have that day. Also, if you would like t-shirts that commemorate that event, celebrating our 110th, please turn them in by tomorrow. We need to get those ordered. And the fellowship committee is asking if anyone would like to help them prepare breakfast for that event on November 8th, please talk to Carol Mueller. And if you uh, have youth, anybody from ages middle school to college, we're going to have a youth worship night October the 25th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the fellowship hall. And I'm sure anybody that shows up will, will be blessed, but that's what it's geared towards the youth. And now we have a special announcement. And if you have your bulletins, you can turn on the back there as Chris comes to tell us more about what's coming up. Morning. Morning. <laughs> My name is Chris Houston. I'm a serving elder here at Central Christian. Uh, and if you, as Lance noticed, as you look at the back of your bulletin for this week and I think the last two weeks, we're announcing that the church will be hosting a missions run uh, this New Year's morning at 7 a.m. It is actually taken from a historic run that my grandfather used to do uh, for he and his running buddies. Uh, but this year, my wife and I wanted to set it up so where we could raise missions funds for some of the local missions here in Matamoros and Reynosa uh, so that they could have a little extra to start the year, especially this year with all the COVID issues we've had. It's been particularly hard for those missions. Uh, so as you can see, it's, it explains everything here on the pamphlet, but I'll give you a rundown is that we're going to be running from Los Fresnos uh, to the insurance agency here in Brownsville. It's nine and a half miles. Uh, you don't have to run. You can bicycle as well. And you don't even have to participate. But we highly encourage you uh, to donate for the people who are running uh, to raise funds. And all the funds that you donate as a church body will go directly to the missions in Matamoros and Reynosa. Uh, runners, it's $20 to sign up, and for those of you that run 10Ks and marathons and such, 20 bucks is the cheapest run you'll ever be a part of. And all it's going to cover is a breakfast that will be held at the insurance agency at the conclusion of the run that morning. Um, if you want to volunteer with logistics and helping move people around before and after the run or picking up food, if you want to donate to the run, please see myself, my wife, or Derek Weaver, who is not here this morning, <laughs> uh, but anyone on the missions team or myself or even Lance, just let them know that your donation is going to the missions fun run. Or if you want to join up in running, see myself uh, and uh, reach out and we'll be able to point you in the right direction. So we look forward to seeing you and thank you for helping us out. Let's stand up. There's a land that is fairer than day. By faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet. Glory. 
Aren't you glad elections only come every four years? <laughs> I'm Grady Deaton, and I'm a serving elder here at Central Christian. It's a pleasure to bring you the communion meditation today. As I'm sure is the case with many of you, and as you could probably tell from my opening prayer, uh, the upcoming national elections have been on my mind. So I thought I'd take a look at some of the elections the U.S. has had in the past. And actually, I want to talk a little bit about early opinion polls and surveys. Anybody remember this? Uh, it's one of the most famous election photographs in history. Dewey defeats Truman was the wrong headline on the front page of the Chicago Daily Tribune on November the 3rd, 1948, the day after the incumbent United States President Harry Truman won an upset victory over the Republican challenger and governor of New York, Thomas Dewey. Anybody working on a degree in business, especially if you're taking the marketing classes, will recognize this photo because it's used as a prime example of survey bias. It was based on one of the first major telephone surveys in the U.S. The problem was it was almost only the well-off Republicans who had telephones back in those days. But the majority of voters, too poor to afford those newfangled machines, were the ones who actually voted for Truman. Hey, a lot's changed since then, right? We don't make these kind of mistakes anymore, right? Uh, I understand that Newsweek printed thousands of these in anticipation of a Hillary Clinton landslide based on early surveys that showed her carrying as much as 85% of the vote that were taken as late as the day before the election. How did that happen? Well, as you can imagine, scholars are still arguing about this and will probably continue to do so for several decades. I'll let you know if I hear anything, but my own guess is that the pollsters were asking leading questions to the people that they knew would give them the answers they wanted to hear, and they were ignoring everybody else. Okay, these are just two examples of really poor surveys in governmental elections, but the fact is that surveys come up with wrong answers all the time. What goes wrong? Well, the short answer is usually that they are asking the wrong people the wrong questions. So what happens when you ask the wrong people the wrong questions about God? You magazine, one of the most respected periodicals in the world. Okay, 
I hate to tell all you old hippies this, but Elton John was wrong. It wasn't the New York Times, and they didn't say God is dead. This is the cover that helped start a major movement in anti-Christian bias, a movement that has been growing in strength ever since. You have to wonder who they surveyed to come up with that cover and what questions were asked. I wish they'd come into this church and ask you all if God was dead. They would have gotten a different answer. Do I hear an amen? amen. I love the award winning God's Not Dead. It's been used as a title track for a movie of the same name. We sing it sometimes here in church. And if I'd have thought about it fast enough, I'd ask Brock to sing it this morning. The main line is God's not dead, he's surely alive. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. That's the answer to that question. If you agree that God's not dead, if you proclaim him to be alive and claim his son as your Lord and Savior, if you're a baptized believer, then we pass on to you Christ's own invitation to join us in this communion in which we commemorate his sacrifice, partaking of the cup that represents his blood and the bread that represents his body, broken for us. We remember the words of the Apostle Matthew who tells us, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for bringing us here. Thank you for the sacrifice that your son made. We pray that you will guide us through these difficult times. We pray that many, many people will come and be able to join us as we partake of this communion, this, this meditation, as we partake of the loaf and the cup. In your son's name we pray, amen.
I love this church. I don't know any other church where the keyboard guy would come up with the song that I needed sung. You know? I mean, thank you. Thank you. You know, this whole church is like that. It really is. I, I got to say, uh, a lot of what went into this communion meditation, one of, one of the most important pieces that I actually didn't get to put into it unless I turned it into a sermon, was a discussion that I had with Lloyd and Nancy after church last week. We were talking about this meditation that was coming up and politics in general. And, and Nancy said, you know, it's really important to vote. It's, it's more important now than ever. And you need to vote not just your conscience, but your Bible. Amen. Okay? But folks, voting in this election may be the most important thing you've done in a long time in the world. Okay? But giving is the most important thing you'll do in a long time for the kingdom of God. We support ministries all over the world. And the whole world needs God right now. I mean everybody. I, I, it's, I read the newspapers and, and, and look at the web and it's like, it's scary. The world needs God. And we're the ones who are bringing, bringing God to the world. So thank you for everything that you give. Uh, I say that not just from us, but from the people who don't even know you're given, but they know that God is in their life all of a sudden, somehow. Let's pray for the offering. Father, thank you. May the funds that we give today be a blessing, not just to those who, who give, but also to those who receive. In your son's name we pray, amen. You'll have a chance to give on the way out. Uh, uh, after after the service at the door thank you very much good morning our scripture reading from tip for today is from acts 23 1. paul looked straight at the sanhedrin and said my brothers i have fulfilled my duty to god in all good conscience to this day and Acts 24, 16. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Good morning again. We've been hearing the term vetting recently or over the past few years especially when people talk about immigration and people coming to America. And the term simply means the process of investigating someone thoroughly, especially in order to ensure that they are suitable for a job requiring secrecy, loyalty, or trustworthiness. Or someone else has said it this way, a process of carefully and critically examining something or someone. If you were able to on your lunch break, as I was, taking some of the Supreme Court justice hearings of Amy Barrett. It was amazing, and it reminded me that I better never run for office because you better have a grasp if you're going to be a senator of constitutional law. Now, I've already voted. I went to Cameron Park, and I lost my microphone. And I went and voted down there. And I went in, and the first thing I did was put my pen back in with the other pens, and the lady looked at me really disgusted and had to take hand sanitizer and clean them. And then after that, I messed up my ballot, and I had read that I could get another one, so I said, I need another ballot, and she kind of rolled her eyes. Well, what happened? I said, well, I picked someone I didn't want to pick, and they were glad to see me leave, I'm sure. I, I didn't even know how to put the thing in there. He's like, turn it the other way. And I thought, this is too complicated for me. So I know I don't want to run for office. So I thought about it, and I wondered what would it be like if you and I were vetted? What if we were called to critical examination in our lives, as we used to say, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us, or you, or me, because that day may come in the not too far off future. It's happening around the world already. In China, the People's Republic of China 
religious organizations as of 2018, Article 5 of their Constitution or their, their law says that religious organizations must adhere to the leadership of the Communist Party of China, abide by the Constitution laws, regulations, rules, and policies, adhere to the principles of independence and self-government, adhere to the direct of China's religion, the director of China's religion, implement the core v values of socialism and maintain national unity, religious harmony, and social stability. On down, Article 17 says that you not only have to follow that, but you must actively participate and advance and support the Communist Party. Religious, Article 17, religious organizations must spread the principles and policies of the Chinese communist system, as well as the national laws, and on and on and on it goes. And you better be a committed Christian in China. Those that fail to comply face closure, censorship, fines, imprisonment. And so in our text this morning from the book of Acts that Janice read for us, chapters 23 and 24, I want to give you a quick background as we see the Apostle Paul going on trial before a secular court. Paul wanted to go back to Jerusalem where he was raised, where he was taught by Gamaliel. And so he goes back despite many warnings from people. Agabus was a prophet and he actually took Paul's belt, tied it around his hands and said, this is what they're going to do to you when you get to Jerusalem. So he goes back, he takes some men with him, and he goes in the temple, and he's already become infamous in the Jewish world, and they recognize Paul in the temple, and a riot breaks out, and they start yelling and attacking him. And so the Roman soldiers nearby, they hear what's going on. They go down, they get Paul, they take him into custody, and they're going to have him flogged and then questioned. And Paul says to the guy that's going to flog him, he says, is it lawful for you to, to flog a Roman citizen? And he says, are you a Roman citizen? He goes and tells his commander. The commander investigates, finds out he is, so they don't beat him. And then he says, you know what, I'm going to keep you here for a while. Well, then Paul's nephew comes and tells the Roman commander there. He says, this, this uh, Paul, they're going to kill him. There's 40 men that have sworn not to eat or drink until they've assassinated him. And so at nighttime, they take Paul to Caesarea, and he's put in the custody of a man named Felix, who the Bible says is well acquainted with the way. In other words, he knows about Christianity. And so Paul's kept there for two years in prison, and the Bible says because Felix wants a bribe. He wants Paul to give him some money to let him go. So he finishes out his term, and a new Roman commander named Festus comes in. As I said earlier, not the one from Gunsmoke. Festus comes in and takes charge, and he doesn't know a lot about Judaism. And so he has a visitor King Agrippa and his wife come to visit him, and they know all about Judaism because they are the ruling vassal king of that area. As long as they pay their taxes to Rome, they're allowed to stay in power. He's the great-grandson of Herod the Great who built the temple and tried to kill the babies in the Christmas narrative. But he comes and he wants to hear... Paul's testimony because he's curious. There's no television in those days. He says, bring him out. And also Festus says, I don't know what to send him to, to Caesar with. I don't know what charge to write down. So help me out here so we can know what he's being charged with. And so Paul comes in and his defense there is classic. And I think it's a great illustration for us today as we think about being vetted and giving testimony for our faith in today and possibly in the future. And so Paul, first of all, starts out, he spoke about his conversion. He talked about what Christ had done for him on the road to Damascus, and he doesn't, first of all, edit out the parts he knows they won't want to hear. You know, when we give our testimony, we've just got to tell it like it is. He told them, first of all, that he had been wrong that he had been persecuting Christians and he was wrong. He admitted his guilt. And that's one of the first steps when you think about coming before God in a saving relationship. 
We've got to admit that we are guilty and we have wronged others as well as the holy God. So Paul tells him all that he had done to Christians, how he'd gotten letters to arrest them. And we've seen that happen many times. People in our culture and our country that have had road to Damascus appearances, not literally, but events in their lives that caused them to step back and say, I was wrong. I was totally wrong. And I think of one that we're very familiar with because many of you have seen or heard about the movie Selma. Governor Wallace pledged as he stood on the, the steps of his uh, inaugural address, as he stood on the building there in 1963 in Alabama, he said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And he was the one that ordered the state troopers in 1965 at the Edmund Pettus Bridge to attack people coming across the bridge who were coming there in a peaceful march. And one of the things the crowd was saying after that, while that was happening was, we love you, Governor Wallace, in our hearts. They continued to show him the love of Christ because most of them were Christ followers. They were Christians. Later on, he was shot. He was paralyzed. And it was those people that he had had attacked on that bridge that visited him and called on him while he was recovering. And he lived another 26 years after the shooting. And he finished the race well because he admitted he had been wrong that day. In 1974, he stood and gave his, his testimony at the Thomas Road Baptist Church. And there he talked about how he had been wrong. And there he gave and made amends with James Hood and Vivian Malone and others who had been hurt that day by the police. And in 1982, he ran for a fourth term as governor, and he got most of the African American or black vote in Alabama. He had admitted what he had done was wrong. It was his road to Damascus experience when he was shot that day. Abby Johnson worked for a clinic in Texas for eight years for Planned Parenthood. And she had a road to Damascus experience in her life in which she was willing to say, I was wrong. She said, I remember one time there was a supervisor that told me that you need to get your quota. And I asked, what do you mean? And she said, your abortion quota. And she said, I thought our public message was we were trying to eliminate abortions. And her supervisor told her, according to her, that's how we make money. And you need to get your quota. She said the tipping point came later on when a physician asked her to come in and help with an ultrasound-guided abortion. And she said, I literally saw that unborn baby trying to push away from the suction trying to survive and she said that was a human being and what I was doing was wrong she said I could not do it anymore and she said I want to choose life and help mothers to do the same there's no crisis pregnancy you're in that God can't find a way out to make it better in the long run and they never talk about the emotional pain that women have years later and I've seen it personally in the ministry it is a heartbreaking thing to carry that guilt forever Paul didn't edit out the parts they did not want to hear. But Paul also refused to edit out the supernatural and the miraculous of that event. It would be difficult for people to believe that a bright light appeared to him, that he was blinded, that he had to go somewhere and be baptized and had to go to a street called Straight and get his life straight. It was so bizarre that Festus, while the trial is going on, interrupts him. And he says to him, your great learning has driven you out of your mind, Paul. In other words, you're a nut. You're telling us about this guy, Jesus, who they crucified and he came back to life and he appeared to you in a bright light on the road to Damascus and he's still living? No way. People don't come back to life. And Paul knew that would be a difficult message for people to accept. And friends, we've got churches and Christians today that want to eliminate all the miraculous and the supernatural. 
It doesn't happen every day, but I have seen things in ministry, and you have too, that are just hard to, to say they were just a circumstance or coincidental. Something happened there that we cannot explain. And we need to tell people how God changed us. And if it was somebody's intervention in our lives that you believe was divine intervention, then tell them that as long as it doesn't contradict the Bible. We all get our moments to speak up, and that's what Paul does. He has a second. We all have a second, a minute, maybe 20 minutes. And it's an opportunity we must grab. I watched just a few minutes of Garth Brooks' Billboard Music Award. The first thing he did, he hasn't lived a perfect life, and he'll tell you that. But the first thing he did is said, I want to thank God, because none of this would be possible without him. And he will tell you that he and Tricia Yearwood, at his second marriage, they have made it all these years because they started to put Jesus at the center of their marriage. P.G. Morgan described the event this way. He says, what an audience for Paul. King, queen, governor, the leading citizens of the city, the leading Roman officials. It is possible that Paul's friend Luke was there as well. To such an august body, Paul made his defense and he preached the gospel. Now, there was no glitter associated with Paul. He didn't have a great physique. In fact, history says that he might have been balding some, had beetle brows, a crooked nose, and bandy legs. But he was full of grace. And he stood up. He had no purple crown. He had chains on. They had him chained as he was brought there. And as he entered that palace in Caesarea in chains, wearing a prisoner's tunic, he got up and filled with the Holy Spirit, told him what Jesus had done to his life. And that's where we have to start. Just tell the truth how Christ has been involved in my life. And second of all, as he's being vetted, the Apostle Paul reminded them of the real problem here. Now some would say that Paul was the problem, and they're angry at Paul, but the real problem was Jesus. That's who they're mad at. Now people have said, and I've heard it said, and I've read that we love Jesus, we don't like the church, or we like Jesus, we don't like organized religion. And I want to say, you've got a problem with Jesus. You have a problem with Jesus. And today, you and I are just the messengers like Paul was. It's not our message. We are just taking the message of Jesus. And a lot of people have a problem with that. And if they want to look at the true Jesus that we see in scriptures, they've got a problem with him. The Muslims have a problem with him because he's not divine. And the Jews have a problem with him because he's not the right type of militant Messiah that they want to come back. And the Eastern religions have a problem with him because they say he's just a holy man like so many before him. And the humanists have a problem with him because they think he was just a nice guy whose followers misunderstood him. And the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists have a problem with him because they say he destroyed their Aryan gods that they used to worship that made them so militant and violent. And, and people today have a problem with Jesus. Because they say, I, I don't like his church. Well, he loves his church. And they have a problem with grace. We say that if you tell people about the grace of God, it's the one thing that makes Christianity different than most other religions. It's not an, a religion of works. It's a religion of God's grace, having sent his son to the cross. But grace is, is offensive to a lot of self-proclaimed humanists today. Because grace... If you talk about grace, then it means you've done something wrong or you're in trouble. The only people that need grace are people that are in trouble. The only people that need grace are people that have committed something like a crime. We talk about, in Christendom, we talk about amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's offensive to the world today. Because the humanist believes we can work it out together. If we all hold hands and put our heads together, there's a goodness within us, within the human spirit, and we can fix it. We don't need divine supernatural intervention. 
But grace says that we have all fallen short of the glory of God and that we need to be forgiven, that we need His grace upon us in order to to live here and also to go to heaven one day. And it is Jesus that they have a problem with. Jesus is the one that said, I have come and you must follow me exclusively. And an all-inclusive culture doesn't want to hear that today. It's Jesus that said, He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will get to the Father except through Him. And they have a problem with that. It is Jesus that said one time that there was a rich man that was in hell. And He said, Please, go back and tell my brothers so they don't come to this horrible place. And Jesus said He couldn't go back if He wanted to. He's happy. Or He's not... Lazarus is happy in heaven. It's Jesus that said, all authority has been given to me. Go and preach the gospel to all nations. It's Jesus that said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. It's Jesus that said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. It's Jesus that said, you better bear fruits in keeping with repentance. There better be some fruit from your life. It's Jesus that said, if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And so today, when we give our testimony, we need to tell them about Jesus. It's his message. And if they have a problem with Jesus, then they'll have to take it up with him one day. And then we see finally, like any good evangelist, and like you and I today, if we get the opportunity, we need to call people to make a decision. We need to call them to step up and make a decision. What will you do with Jesus? And that's what Paul does. Because Agrippa says to him, Do you think so quickly you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul says, Yes, I wish you would be like me, except for these chains on my hands. Every preacher that pours out their heart to people Every elder, every person here today, when you tell people about how God's changed you uh, and how discouraging it must feel for us when we see people say, I don't want to hear anymore. I don't want to respond. I'd rather stay in my pew. I'd rather stay home. I'd rather stay in my chair. We need to ask people to make a decision every time. Paul preached as a dying man to dying men. Paul preached as though it would be his last message ever. In an interview with Preaching Magazine, it was a famous preacher, Dr. James Macy of Detroit's Metropolitan Church of God, and they asked him the question about calling for a decision. He said, yes, every time. As a preacher, you must persuade people to act upon the information placed before them in the text. All information concerning Jesus Christ presents them with a decision. As I receive the information, I must be persuaded to act upon it. All New Testament witness concerning Jesus Christ presents implications. And I must be persuaded to act upon the implications, to trust the implications. It's not only the preacher who must heed these implications, but all those who hear his voice. And so Paul, he calls for a decision. And so Paul passed the test that day. And as we begin this, I I mentioned that you and I might have to stand one day. Maybe we are at work, maybe with a family member. Are you willing? Are you willing and able to pass the test? Well, they say, yes, he or she was a committed Christian. They are a committed Christian. This morning, if you're not, you have an opportunity to get your life right. If you have already obeyed Christ and you've drifted away, ask him to to reignite you, to put another spark in your heart to be what you know you should be. And this morning, if you're not a believer and you've never come to Jesus in faith and obedience, we want to invite you to come forward. I'd love to talk to you about following Him as your Lord and Savior. This morning, if you're looking for a church family or you're watching online and you'd like to know more about what we're doing and what you can do to get involved, let us please uh, respond to that, that call as well. And maybe this morning you want someone to pray with you as we stand and sing if you have a decision.
bless you and keep you as you begin a new week. We pray now for the sick and the shut-in. We pray for those who have drifted spiritually. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful